This is 89.7 FM. Broadcasting live 24 hours a day. 89.7 FM. We just came from playing you a song by Wycliffe Jean, and uh, that's a song called Take Me As I Am. So yes, right now it's uh, the business buzz, and we're joined in studio, you know, by uh, Doc. Uh, Doctor, it's Mzu. Yeah, it's Mzu. No, D, Kid. Yes. <laughs> no, because I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, don't want to pronounce it wrong, you know, so I'm just going to let uh, Deepa start. Okay, I'm going to start off with, why did you decide to become a doctor? <laughs> Straight um, into it. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, a, that's a, a nice question. Um, look, when, when I was in high school, when I was in high school, uh, uh, ironically, I wanted to do information systems. Okay, And I applied to Rhodes. Oh, okay. But uh, I got it very bad. So, <laughs> at that time, I didn't have it. This was in 99. So, second in the list was medicine. And uh, fortunately, I, I, I got a scholarship. And, and that's it. The rest is history. And where were you trained for this specific career? I trained in the University of Santa Clara, which is found in, in Cuba. Oh, wow. In the Caribbean area. Okay. And... So this hasn't always been an interest of yours. When did it start becoming a major interest? Hey, look, um, I was just fascinated by information systems, but uh, medicine has been close to my heart. Um, and also, I think my background played its own role because uh, at the tender age, I, I had to take care of my, my grandparents. And uh, I think from there, and the love to the world. Okay. And last question from my side, what is it like to be a doctor in this day and age? <laughs> All right. Um, well, being a doctor, it's, it's interesting. At the same time, you get to be faced with a lot of uh, unpleasant decisions that okay. you have to take sometimes, especially when you're king in a, a scarce resource country like ours. You, you sometimes have to make uh, very unpleasant Okay, I'm just gonna <clears throat> bring it back to 1999 because you said this is when information systems are still, you know, at the top of your agenda. And right now you find yourself at Rhodes Business School, you know, studying towards, you know, an MBA. Maybe take us through your history in terms of the institutions, you know, that that you found yourself at. All right. So this, this I finished my matric in 99. In a public school in Pedi called Nathaniel Pamula. Um, then I, I was made to believe that I was the best matriculant there in that year. So I applied at Rhodes, but uh, my Africans wasn't good. Yeah. So I had to go, I think the letter was that I need to get computer skills or something. Uh, so I ended up applying for the 2000 scholarship, the Cuban scholarship. Um, unfortunately, I qualified, but they said the group had already gone. So I needed to wait for something like two years. Uh, at that time, I went to Forte. Yeah. Um, at Forte, the entry was through the um, political sciences, uh, which didn't last because I, I think it was mid 2002. Where I reapplied for the for the Cuban scholarship. Yeah. And uh, then, then I, I got the scholarship, and uh, we we left the country in September because the the academic year starts in September and finishes in June. Yeah. yeah. So so that was it. I got to Cuba. On, I left South Africa on September the tenth, two thousand and two, uh, and the rest is history. Okay. How long were you in Cuba for? Was it for the full sort of seven years or? Um, no. Uh, the, the way the program works is that uh, we do five years of, of medical training in Cuba and then you do your final sixth year here because at that time they had reduced it to six years. Yeah. So you do your final year in, in South Africa. Okay. But 
the, the actual number of years you spend in Cuba is six. Yeah. Because they, you have to learn Spanish. Okay, okay. Uh, in order to be able to go through. So yeah. If you fail your Spanish, then you say goodbye to the medical. Yeah. Degree. <laughs> okay, so basically you came back uh, 2007. 2007, 2008. Yeah, 2008. 2008, and then it was. And I went, I went to the University of Pretoria. Yeah. For the final year. Okay. So how it happens is that when you are done in Cuba, once you finish your fifth year in Cuba, yeah, you come and join South Africans in their final year. Yeah. Now, different institutions are doing it differently, um, but the University of Pretoria is the one that takes you straight into the final year with their final year students. Yeah. So, and then after that you write the final exam with the students at the University of Pretoria. Mm. Once you write that exam, you still have to be retested by the Cubans and, <laughs> and write a state exam. Okay, so there was practice. some back and forth. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so that means you've been in, pra you were in practice from about, what, 2010? Yeah, I started practicing in 2010. Okay. And I know that you're a specialist. When did that happen? Uh, we call me a specialist, the doctors will kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but I do have a specialty in obstetrics and, and gynecology. Yeah. I did my diploma there yeah. because that's not a fellowship. Those are two different things. Oh, okay, okay. I did my diploma in uh, in obstetrics and gyne in 2013. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the specialty that I have. And uh, yeah, that's basically that. Mm. Um, that was after my community service. Okay. Okay, this is a business show, and we know that you're doing your master's in administration. So you, you, you might, we want to understand, uh, you know, from, you know, coming from the information systems into medicine, <laughs> and then doing the diploma in obstetrics and uh, gaining now, and then now MBA, well, what's prompted that decision? Look, um, I always get this question from my friends. I think... First of all, to, to give a genuine answer to that is that uh, one needs to wanted to understand the, the business side of health and to learn the trades in the corporate uh, world before one can go private if one decides to go private. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of things, it's also important to diversify your knowledge and not be stuck in, in, in one thing. And I always tell my friend that medicine after so many years in med school and uh, years in practicing, it becomes boring sometimes. Mm. So you gotta you gotta diversify your your knowledge. Okay, and then uh, okay from that point of view, I guess what type of you know experiences do you think that you were able to gain, let's say, from the Cuban um, environment that you think have helped you, you know, to sort of go far here in South Africa. Look, without any doubt, uh, I think um, resilience is, is, is one of the most important things that I learned from the Cuban people. And uh, I can tell you now that if I made it in Havana, I can make it anywhere. <laughs> um, the, the way the Cuban people are, uh, I must say that they were very welcoming towards us. They gave us the best that they could under the circumstances. and. Uh, I feel forever indebted to them. But uh, I think one distinct, one factor that I can say distinguishes the Cuban people or the Cuban way of doing things from the South African way of doing things is that, as you know, Cuba has been under the economic blockage by the United States yeah. for over uh, five decades now. Yeah. That is why that they're trying to sort it out now. Um, now, in Cuba, one of the things that they've been accused of is the, the question around human rights, freedom of speech, and all of that. The way they do things there is that young people are channeled to go to school and study, and they are empowered with information. Okay? Uh, and and then, then later in life, once you've got the information, then you are given the freedom to question the, the policies of the country. And I think that's, a, for me, that's the different way because, I mean, what would you do with a freedom of speech if you don't have content? You know, you, you, you really question things that, uh, I mean, the wisdom that is there, how do you then question it if you don't have information? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's what distinguishes uh, the Cuban young people uh, if you look 
the, the, I'm not saying South Africa is wrong, they were doing it, it's just different systems. Mm. You know, uh, Cubans are called communists and we are a capitalist country, so you can understand mm. the differences. And now that you know you have a greater you know appreciation of business, can you sort of give us an insight on their business environment and maybe Look, some things you want to implement here that you've seen there? Look, um, Chuba, it, it, it says the communist country. Look, when when I were there, I think we tried at some stage to look for their GDP. Yeah. yeah on the net, <laughs> and just write X X X. You can't find anything. Yeah. Um, but they generate their GDP on tourism. Yeah. They are big on that. And something that I think we can leverage as a country is the celebration of your your historic uh, monuments. Mm. Or, because they, they, they use a lot of that. You yeah. know, their towns are historic. Yeah. They don't look anything like Joburg and Cape Town. Yeah. They, they use the old architecture, all of those things. So I think we can leverage from that. But as a communist country, you wouldn't see a prominence in business. Yeah, okay. The only thing that would be business related would be the feria in Havana, yeah. when they bring all the countries together. And, uh, and that's the only thing that would be on the news and is prominently business. Because they don't really uh, encourage this thing of privatization and all of those things. I mean, healthcare is owned by the state. Uh, you can go private. All yeah. the doctors work for the government. I mean, you can really go private and uh, education is free <laughs> okay okay so, i think uh, you know just bringing it back you know to south africa to yeah. the studio and to you like you if you saying that you matriculated in 2000 and in 1999 and that you ended up being qualified in let's say 2009 right that's it's almost a 10 year yeah. it's almost a 10 year period and you know this is a question we ask almost all the all our guests mm -hmm. Do you think education matters? And when I and that and by that question, I'm asking, the stuff you learn in class does it actually apply to real life, or is school something people go through just because you need a qualification in life? Sure. <laughs> um, look, education matters. Yeah. Okay. And um, the the fact that it was ten years is the price that one has to pay if you go to med school. Yeah. You know because I mean. Uh, med school is, is, is like you are in a business of saving lives and that's a business that you need to take pretty seriously. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I think uh, sometimes young people uh, underestimate the power of education. Yeah. I can tell you today that education is the ultimate equalizer. Yeah. And uh, every minute that you spend in, in the library yeah is worth it. <laughs> I can tell you that much. It's worth every minute that you spend reading your books. Once you get outside there, it might not be a direct translation of what you were studying, but you would have to apply the knowledge. Yeah. And uh, depending on how much you apply yourself, and then you'll get the, mm. you'll get the benefits. And what keeps you hungry? Um, look, you, you can never be satisfied. Yeah. You know, you... you you can never be complacent and say, no, I've, I've arrived. You, you haven't. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one of the things that uh, we need to do away in our culture, as, especially we're talking to, to black people in South Africa. You know, the, the expectation is that once we have a, a degree or a job that is paying well, the next thing is you have to get married and get kids and then die. That, mm. that's, that we need to challenge that conventional thinking. You, mm. you can't be satisfied. Mm. You need to keep on keeping on. Okay. And uh, I think something else that the young people would be interested to know is, do you have, because you're still, you know, young yourself, but do you have any mentors in your life that uh, sort of have guided wow. you along the path? Look, uh, to be honest with you, you know, you, you ra you're raising a, a very emotional thing. Yeah. In life, you do need people like that. I mean, if you go to my family, my, I'm, I'm coming from very humble. Yeah. humble beginnings and I think in my family I'm the first person to have a degree mm. but I got people in life that uh, lifted me up yeah. um, maybe I can mention Mrs. Kwaju uh, who's the person who identified me when I was still at 40 yeah. you know, and asked me oh, but look what, what are you doing <laughs> you, you, you look like you do well in, in medicine. I like no. I applied for medicine, and you told me I was late. And you should. Yeah. And I said no. 
then apply, reapply. You know, so there are a lot of people. I mean, there's a lady called Mamuzita who played a role in my life. Though, and you notice that they are women. Yeah. 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 So, and then, I mean, the, the, the other thing is, I think sometimes we use our background uh, as an excuse, you yeah. know, to, to probably end up somewhere in life, end up taking drugs. But I used mine as an inspiration to, yeah. to get out of yeah. that situation. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that I'm out. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, unfortunately, you know, because of time, yeah. because I'd really love to, you know, flesh some of these issues out, um, I only have time for two more questions. And uh, the first question is this. In your experience, because like I said, you know, you're still, you know, relatively young, which means I'm sure you have engagement uh, with the, you know, young people. What are the young people doing wrong coming out of university at the moment that you see that is an area of uh, possible improvement? Look, Madiwa, I think young people uh, lack role models. Yeah. I don't think it's entirely their fault. And uh, I think it's not, even when I was at school, it was not properly explained to me why it's important to, to go to school. Okay. Uh, so I do sometimes uh, go to, to my high school yeah. and try to explain to them. The sad thing about it um, is that I'm almost every day in the hospital where I work uh, in maternity. Yeah. I, I deliver 14-year-olds. 16 year old. I mean, I had a 16 year old who was coming in for the second baby. Okay. Nice. You know, that, that, that's sad because when you look at the young the teenager at 16 who's got a second child, you start to ask yourself what has gone wrong with our society. Yeah. You know, so, but, but I think the only thing they are yearning out there, young people, they're looking for role models. Yeah. They're looking for people who can give them direction and actually tell them why is it important to stay in that classroom. Mm. You know, and I don't think we're doing great as a country. Um, that, that's that's the sad thing about it. It's very emotional for me. Yeah. Okay. And I think, you know, the last thing we have time for is, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Or a situation that, uh, you know, gave you that type of enlightenment where you're like, that's an aha moment. Let, let me stick with the, with the first part of it. You know, when I was about to leave, when I was about to go to Cuba, um, by that time I was, I was in the SRC at 40. So then I left, I went home. My uncle, who was a principal in one of the high schools, I told, I told him the story that, look, I'm going to a country that I don't even know what they eat. I don't know the language that they are speaking, and, uh, but I'm going. And then he told me that, look, when you go out there, don't you ever think that uh, people are meant to be fair, OK? They, they, they are not supposed to, to do you favors. Yeah. You know, nobody's going to do you a mm. favor. And uh, you must always know that it's you against the world. If you have people who smile and, uh, and embrace you, you must take those people in. And, uh, and just always remember that people are not meant to be fair. You must make your own luck. Mm. Mm. Uh, you can't be... <coughs> so I think that, that actually pushed me to the limit because I, I just... I'm not, I don't have the mentality of, of handouts and, mm. and favors being done for me. I've, I've just developed that thing. Okay. And I think Cuba helped you on top of it with the resilience. Yeah. yeah. Ah, that's a very good piece of advice. Thank you so much, uh, you know, to Dr. Mzu for coming through to the studio. I have to say, like, it, it went deep, like, you know, <laughs> it, it really got deep. You know, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to engage with you at another time. You know, maybe focus on, on ways in which, you know, we can improve, let's say, mentorship programs in schools, for example. You know what I mean? So that was us. That was our interview with, uh, you know, with, with Mzu. A uh, big thank you to him for coming through to the studio. 89.7 FM.